So our final speaker is Nick Brown. Uh, he's a research fellow at EPP, or sorry, EPCC University of Edinburgh. His interests are around exploiting novel hardware uh, architectures for high performance computing workloads. And as part of this, he sits across both the hardware itself and the compilers and runtimes on the software side. In the past, he has developed numerous scientific simulation codes, including the high resolution atmospheric model used by the Met Office in the UK. So yeah, so good afternoon. Uh, my name's Nick, as just said, I'm really interested in the role of FPGAs for accelerating HPC codes. And something we've heard a lot about today and yesterday is AMD's Versal architecture with the AI engines. And for instance, the VCK5000 that we use in this work, we've got 400 of these engines, each is capable of performing eight single precision floating point operations per cycle. So when you run the numbers, it's fairly impressive raw compute performance. And really the purpose of this short paper is an experience report to kick the tires of the technology. You know, how far can we push these for HPC style codes and what lessons can we learn along the way? So the vehicle for doing this is actually a code I developed a number of years ago with the Met Office in the UK. It's their uh, high resolution atmospheric model. As we speak, it'll be running on supercomputers other side of the world. And when you look at this, quite a large portion of the runtime is spent doing atmospheric advection, which is moving things through the air due to um, kinetic effects, due to wind. And quite a lot of the runtime on the CPU is stalled because of memory or other microarchitecture bound issues. So in previous work, we moved this to a U280 FPGA, really looking at specializing the PL side of things for the memory architecture with a 3D shift buffer to try and turn that red into green. And that worked compared with the CPU, but certainly the GPU, the V100, is a tough customer to beat here. So when we look at this data flow view, our HLS data flow regions, our HLS streams, what our proposition, what our hypothesis is, is well, maybe the versal, we get the best of both worlds because with the PL, we can still do this tailoring of the memory to suit the application, but we've got the AI engines, which are our computational workhorse. So we can use them to really benefit that side of things. So that's where we were looking at here, as I say, to see how far we could push this. And so what we've got is U, V and W, if you can see it on the slide, that's because we're working with three fields. It's the wind components in the X, Y and Z dimension. And for each of these fields, we have a separate kernel running on a separate AI engine initially. So on the top right, that's what it looks like when we pop this on the AI engine array. And for each of these fields, we've got these bullet points on the left with the operations that it's working with. Now, unfortunately, the tooling can't deal with six-way vectorization. You've either got four or you've got eight. So we have to do some padding. And therefore, this flowchart um, towards the bottom middle are all the operations going on per field for each AI engine with these 16 values popped in, these 16 single precision numbers, eight plus eight, and then a further eight going in multiplied at the next stage. Much more detail in the paper how we do this, but we built it, we run it, it works, but compared with the PL only on the VCK 5000, this was pretty disappointing. And the reason for this is each of these kernels, each of these AI engines, the maximum you can have are two input streams. And from the PL perspective, each of these is 128 bits maximum. So for each field per cycle, we can put on eight single precision values. But in fact, we need 24. So we've got an initiation interval of three or only every three cycles from the PL side of things can we send a grid point over. And therefore per field, we decided to break this up. So instead of having one AI engine, well, we'll have five of these. You can see towards the bottom on the right. And crucially, what this meant is it brought a lot more of these streams into play. So per cycle on the PL, we can now send the entirety of a grid point over in that cycle. And also it enables these to specialize more and gives us more powerlessness. But it's not all good news because we are tying the amount of computation for each AI engine 
to these 128 bit streams effectively, these four values. So whereas they're capable of eight, doing eight way floating point vectorization, we're in fact only doing four way floating point vectorization. So we're leaving some of that performance on the table. But hey, this gives us a performance uplift, even if it is still not yet reaching the PL approach. And the reason for that, when we looked at this in more detail, was the way in which we were connecting these AI engines within the array. We were looking at doing this via these 32-bit streams internally, and that then had overhead in terms of sending these four values onto the next AI engine. Now, in the paper, we go into more detail exploring the cascade streams on the array. These are much wider, 384 bits wide. They look like they would do exactly what we wanted, but crucially, you only have one per AI engine. So what this really limited was the structure of how we could lay these things out and interconnect them together. And we couldn't do this thing at the end where we have two AI engines feeding into one with their partial results. And it meant we had to adopt this thing at the bottom and we had the same issues that we had initially. So instead, moving to using windows or buffers here. And if I'm honest, initially we discounted this approach. And the reason we discounted this approach is with these, what you've got is your data in the window, it's all consumed, your AI engines effectively shut down, they start back up with the next piece of data in the window. And then that gets consumed, it's shut down again, started back up. So on a grid point by grid point basis, this was terrible. They were shutting down, they were starting back up all the time, and we couldn't do this pipelining that we need for the seven-way VLIW core. But instead, what we can do is we can chunk our grid points. So we found that actually it's very effective working in blocks of 512 grid points. And that number is just so we can stay within the memory of each AI engine array. Not least because the tooling implements these as ping pong buffers. So we're serving out for the current block into the AI engine, whilst another block is being filled for the, um, the next block of grid points. And this is really where we start to close down on the PL only approach and get a nice performance uplift. And then lastly here, what we found we could do is I mentioned before we were only using four vectorization slots rather than eight of them because of that width of the input stream. But actually we don't have that with these windows. Actually it's much more convenient to load in effectively two grid points at a time. So we can load the first one in for the first four slots, the next one in for the next four slots and keep these things busy. And also there was some, um, uh, some challenges that the last stage was busier than the rest. So we moved some of that back onto the PL and we got again, a nice performance uplift. So I was very excited because we had one compute unit on the PL. We were using 15 of these AI engines, five per field. And now it was time to scale this up, scale up more CUs on the PL, more AI engines into play and how far we could push this. But actually, this is where things started to unravel a bit. Because as far as we could push this, this is the diagram of what our AI engine array looked like. And what you can see is there's lots and lots of empty slots. And the reason for this, and we just hadn't connected this, it's not that obvious from the documentation, is there's a maximum of 312 32-bit streams connecting the PL to the AI engine array. So effectively, this gives you 78 128-bit streams. Now, crucially, for each of our CU on the PL, we need 18 of these streams, six per field. So as you start to scale this up, very quickly, these get exhausted. As we actually move to four compute units with 72 of these streams, only using 60 AI engines. And that was the big fundamental limit, unfortunately, we found here with doing this and pushing this forwards. But still, you know, we can run the numbers and see what this gives us in terms of the performance. So the top three are just what I showed you before on the Alveo, on um, Xeon Plasinum, and also V100. Below the line is the VCK5000 PL only, so no AI engines at all here. And we can fit two more compute units on than we could with the Alveo, and this goes faster, which is actually quite impressive, bearing in mind the U280 High bandwidth memory, the VCK5000 doesn't. U280 is 300 megahertz, VCK5000 is only 250. So there's quite a bit of inequality there, 
but it's still outperforming it. With the AI engines, we can only fit four compute units on, but even though with that, it is matching the performance of the U280. It's a real shame we couldn't bring more of these into play with doing this. And then lastly, we combine them together. So we had our AI engines and our compute units, and then the PL that we had left over, we just filled that in with PL only approach. And that doubled the performance that we could get on the U280. So just to conclude, I suppose the three main takeaways, it's a really impressive architecture, but you need lots and lots of compute on those AI engines compared with the data coming on and going off. And you've got to be really aware of those links. And you're challenged because you've not got much memory on there, only 32K per engine. Two, actually getting the data shunted around is a real challenge. And these windows I think can really help here, especially if we bring that ping pong buffering into play. And thirdly, it's not just about the AI engines, it's not just about the PL, but it's using the entirety of the chip and filling all that up. So thank you very much for listening. I've got a poster in the session tomorrow afternoon. Any questions, any comments, love to chat to you then or during the break today. So thank you.